Alrighty, welcome everybody to the second day of the Wise Inspire conference. My name is Sean and I'm super excited, um, you know, for the final day and, and for our special guest speaker, Brian Wu, who's a dear friend of mine who I met at uh, Intel ISF. So, so I'm super excited uh, for today's session. Uh, again, my name is Sean Big. I'm the co-founder and, and CEO of uh, Young Scientists and Innovators. I founded it with my friend uh, Thomas after, you know, competing in science fairs here in Montreal growing up. And we were given these incredible opportunities, whether it be working with incredible organizations and companies uh, to kind of realize our projects and turn them into uh, startups. And so we realized that, you know, talent is every, everywhere, but opportunities is not. And so that's the main goal of YSI, where we train young people to find sustainable solutions for the world's most pressing issues. Uh, and to do so, we help young people discover the extraordinary untapped potential that they hold within by giving them the tools necessary to, necessary, um, to make the changes they want to see in the world. So we want to talk uh, before we get into um, you know, this incredibly inspiring session with Brian. We're going to explain a little bit about what we do exactly, and then we'll get right into uh, listening to Brian. So uh, yeah, Cyril, take it away. Hey everyone, my name is Cyril and I'm uh, studying currently in mechanical engineering at McGill University uh, and I am the community um, outreach lead at uh, YSI. Um, here my role is to create the community of the science fair community that we will all benefit from uh, by keeping contact with this network, by creating this network at first and cultivating these, the, the opportunities that we can find within this network. Um, and so my goal here is to bring um, all the past and present uh, science fair people together in a place where uh, they can brainstorm ideas bigger than themselves. Um, and, and we do that by you know, offering uh, different opportunities for this, this, this team to get together and, and work on, on important issues. And um, we do these by first starting by talks. Uh, we organize talks in different schools where we go and motivate people uh, that are already in the science fair spectrum to uh, get their friends on board. And we talk to people that are not in the, the science fair spectrum to try and, and, and get involved within the science fair. So by working to, to, to find new members to this community, we are expanding and expansion is, is, is um, growth is always the way of, of progress. And we want to build a bigger community to have more minds to tackle um, uh, the problems that we face. Uh, and so with this group that we form, we then go towards um, working on initiatives such as the uh, ventilator um, project that we worked on uh, earlier this year, um, where we, with the, with the team of science fair students from YSI, built a, a mechanical respirator for the, uh, for the Montreal hospital, um, trying to provide, you know, a solution to the uh, COVID crisis and the shortage, shortages, sorry, of this uh, essential medical equipment. Um, and, and another example of what you know this community is able to do by by constructing it and building it in this way uh, is the facial initiative, where YSI uh, was able to set up in a couple of days a full distribution. Um, you know all the logistics for facial production, distribution, and assembling um, to provide to some of the key um, key hospitals in Montreal and in the greater region of Montreal uh, the facials needed to provide the care that we need in the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. And so these are the the few things that you know YSI does with its community uh, to really leave a mark uh, and uh, enable uh, greater things. Um, so my name is Crystal Rudinsky. Um, I'm a second year UBC student studying psychology and I'm really proud to be the director of operations at YSI and I'm really excited to be able to present this platform to you guys because it's packed full of so many successful people with advice worth gold and honestly I wish I had, I wish I had someone like Sean and his team and this amazing team to guide me in my science fair days. So I'm really excited to be able to show, share this with you guys. In terms of the work I've done I've done things from isolating super bacteria to figuring out a much more improved screening test for Alzheimer's disease. And I might be a familiar face in the Calgary community as I've participated many times in the Calgary Youth Science Fair and in the Canada Wide. And I was super lucky to get to go to ISEF as well. And my biggest takeaway from these events was the people and the memories I made. So I can't wait to be able to make those memories with you guys and help you guys out now in order for you to get to those places, the places you want to get in the STEM world. 
So one of our missions in order to do that is to empower you guys. That's to give you the tools, the opportunity, and the resources to discover and make changes. And we've got two big outlets for that. So the first one is the incubator, where every year we take 10 to 20 students annually with incredible projects and help them turn those into companies that improve lives and disrupt industries by the end of our 10 week program. And the second one is our mentorship, where you'll receive one on one uh, mentorship from industry professionals, researchers and startups to carry out your project and get past the science fair death valley. Awesome. And our last pillar is the promote pillar. And so uh, kind of how we engage with uh, people and kind of share stories in STEM. We have conferences like these. We have our YSI Lives, which is on our Instagram and also posted to our YouTubes where we have incredible people who are, you know, way more successful and inspiring than I am. And we have these conversations with them. We also have the fellowship, which is going to start this summer, which I'm truly excited for. Essentially, we're grouping together the smartest young people in the world who in 10 years time will be influential on a worldwide scale. You know, we're the, the thinking behind this is that the best way to predict the future is to create it. And so instead of having, uh, you know, later on all these future Nobel laureates, why not just work together now? And so uh, not only do they give talks at their local uh, cities, those fellows are spread all across the world, but each year a new core a cohort of high profile talents are partner with companies to select a pressing global issue to find a low cost uh, sustainable solution for. So people we're talking with right now is the Sean Mendes Foundation, National Geographic, to you know potentially launch uh, microsatellites into space to test the atmosphere of Venus, and you know other cool projects. And so we're really taking the most inspiring young people across the world, um, around 10 to 15 to work on a single project. And so if that's something that you'd be interested in, applications will open up uh, soon. So you can definitely uh, stay tuned on our Instagram, on socials or through our website to get more information about it. And before we continue in, um, I just wanna let you know that uh, we're gonna have a game at the end of this, um, you know, for whoever's here live, uh, an Among Us game. So you can have that downloaded. We're giving, us, uh, giving away a free Adobe Creative Cloud membership. And so uh, that's pretty uh, exciting. Uh, it's free and forever. Yeah, you don't have to renew the membership. Uh, so yeah, Ronnie, uh, take it away. Hi guys, my name is Ronnie Zacks. I'm um, a second year university student at Concordia University in kinesiology and exercise physiology. And I am very, very passionate about the anatomy and physiology of the human body. And I have a lot of interest in research in that field, especially of the way exercise could promote our health, um, our being and our mental health as well. So especially in times like this, COVID, which is really important. Um, but I got involved with YSI after having met with Sean during my first year in university. And I learned a lot about science fairs and many other STEM organizations. That made me realize that I've never been informed about such opportunities and experiences which was unfortunate, although I didn't want the same to happen for the next generation, which is you guys. So after learning about YSI and their goal, I strongly believe that together we can inspire, empower, and promote the young people of today to find sustainable solutions for the world's most pressing issues. And therefore I became the outreach um, director in some sense of, our, of the YSI, where I reach to other schools and I promote YSI and therefore I'm here uh, standing by my dear colleagues and we are here to present YSI and represent Brian Wu today. I'm going to let it off to Cyril and uh, enjoy. It's always, thank you, Ronnie. It's always great to hear, you know, the, the team talk about YSI because we, we spend a lot of time working on these things uh, and, and it's always nice to hear uh, the team, you know, go over what we actually do uh, and hear it again. And it, it, it gives us energy, it gives me energy every time. Um, I'd love to be able uh, to now uh, present to you our, our speaker today, uh, my very good friend, Brian Wu. Um, I personally met him, if I can make a personal introduction, um, last year when we were working on the uh, mechanical ventilator um, for uh, the, the Montreal General Hospital Foundation. 
Uh, and he was sort of our systems engineering lead where he would connect uh, the machine learning side with the, um, with the mechanical design side. And, and that can be seen a lot in his studies. Um, today, Brian is, work, is, a, is a freshman at Stanford University who's hoping to major in engineering physics and computer science and economics or any combination of those. So you really realize, you know, the brain of, of Brian and how he uh, combines all these things in one and he's such a well-rounded guy. Uh, he's also uh, with me, the, the co-founder of, of Vitor Joe, which we sort of branched off the, the team that we initially worked with for the ventilator. And so this is, once again, another proof of what YSI uh, leads you to do, uh, brings you to do. Um, Vitor Drone is a drone delivery company uh, where we build modular, low-cost, and infrastructure-free drones augmented by uh, AI for emergency and medical relief. Um, and of numerous other applications. And um, he's, Brian has a capacity, a very um, interesting passion about how technologies can be used to make humankind and inter interplanetary species um, more efficient uh, towards reaching uh, their goals of so sustainability and uh, success uh, in their endeavors. Um, everything intrigues Brian, to be honest, that we will talk about airfoils together, we will talk about uh, coding, about machine vision, about explosions, uh, everything can be, uh, Brian can be an expert on, uh, on everything in no time, and so it's, honor, it's an honor to present him today and, and to have the chance to talk um, to him about um, what his work and um, what he's doing today. Um, he's also working on, on songs, you know, on, on stand-up comedy uh, to, to, to write, uh, memes to generate, and most importantly, exploring uh, whichever part of the world he's currently in, on foot, or on a bike. So please welcome Brian Wu. Yeah, for sure. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming today, and big thanks to Studio, Sean, the rest of the YSI team for uh, connecting you to this opportunity. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, I guess, you know, starting from when I was like just a kid, one of the things that has really fascinated me was just looking at space. I'm sure all of y'all have, you know, like when you were younger, you had some things that you were really passionate about. And for me, the first thing that I really remember doing a lot of was playing with this jigsaw puzzle of the nine planets at that time. And, um, you know, like many years later, they said Pluto was going to be a planet. But because of that, I think Pluto is always going to be a planet. But with that, Playing with that jigsaw puzzle really made me realize was that, you know, like this is space is definitely one area where I want to spend a lot of my attention and where I want to definitely spend a lot of my life um, innovating in the space and exploring the space. But I, ob I obviously did not know at that time. I just thought space was cool, launching rockets in space is cool. And that's what I ended up doing for a lot of my elementary school. Um, myself with a bunch of friends, we would uh, just uh, buy a lot of mo model rocket parts, we put them together. And then we'd fire them off to see which rocket go, could go the highest. And um, from that point on, that was when I really realized, you know, like there is something about space that's really attracting me in. I went to the library. I checked out every single possible book that I could on the history of space exploration, on astronomy and all of that. But it really wasn't until, um, it wasn't until the fall, I mean, the summer of my freshman year in high school that I really, um, that I really realized there's something that I actually want to do in astronomy and that's to try to find a new way um, to try to find a new way of solving problems in planetary sciences. Now planetary sciences is this really broad field. Um, there are so many different ways of discussing planet, discovering planets and when I, um, when I thought about all those different ways I was like wow that is really cool and it seems like it's also much more accessible given that today's world is so data driven and that it's so easy to learn a lot of, you know, like computational techniques for processing this data that's been collected by telescopes. Because there's a shortage of data that a lot of, um, a lot of institutions have, but not enough people to analyze all the data. Summer of my freshman year, um, I decided I wanted to try to solve a problem in that space. I reached out to a bunch of professors in uh, various universities across the US um, ultimately, I heard back from one at the University of Arizona and one at the University of Florida. And I decided to work in Florida because um, Florida is, you know, it's tropical, it's hot, it's got good beaches and all that. But what was really special about this opportunity working at the University of Florida is that um, I, I got really lucky to, uh, to work with a professor who really emphasizes project-based learning. And he was like, instead of working on, you know, like one of my grad students' projects, 
I want you to try to design your own project and spend the summer, maybe um, future summers as well, trying to make that into reality. And that's pretty much what I did. So I asked the professor a lot about, you know, like what kinds of research opportunities have you personally been engaged in? It turns out he's really passionate about optics, uh, more specifically building the instruments that can discover exoplanets. And I heard about him, I heard from him that several years ago he conducted the survey called Marvels, um, not the company that made all the superhero uh, films, but Marvels is actually a data, um, like a data collecting initiative that collected the stellar spectra of stars using something called the radial velocity method. Now, though all of that sounds pretty complicated, so let's sort of break that down a bit. Um, let's imagine that you have a planet that's just orbiting around a star. So as the planet is going uh, around the star, the planet is actually going to be um, having like gravitational influence on the star. And what that means from the star's perspective is that because of the planet, the star is actually going to get pushed back and forth in its orbit like that. So it's going to start wobbling. And all of that is because of this very fundamental law in physics called Newton's third law of, um, of, of um, kinematics. And it's just, um, it's just a really, I, I think it's a very beautiful and very elegant method for finding these objects outside our solar system. So how do we look for these planets now that we have this wobble? Well, if we look at, if we recall that like the stars in its wobble, it's going to be moving towards us and then away from us and so on. And it's going to be doing that over and over again. So we can point telescopes at many stars. And for, um, for, the, uh, for the stars that we're looking at, we actually take their starlight and we pass it through a spectrograph. So if like the star is moving towards the observer, then the spectral lines will shift towards the blue end of the spectrum and the opposite is also true. As the star is moving away from the observer, the spectral lines will shift towards the red end of the spectrum. So if, if a star has a planet, all we have to do is look at the spectra over time and see if like those lines in the spectrum are moving back and forth. So look, that back and forth motion is critical to discovering exoplanets. Um, now that's how the survey worked. Um, my personal goal was to analyze this data to see if I could find any other planets that haven't been discovered. And so freshman year, I worked on primarily software that allowed us to take these um, spectral lines, look at how they shift, and then use that information to tell us if there's a planet or not, and if so, what kind of planet is orbiting the star. So that, that's what I spent a lot of my fre uh, freshman summer doing. The next two summers that I worked at the University of Florida, I actually focused on something more interesting, because the first thing I discovered um, out of all of this was that there was actually a planet that's not like any of the other ones I looked at. So all of the planets in our solar system orbit around the sun, but this planet that I was looking at was actually orbiting around two stars. So very similar to Tatooine from Star Wars, that super iconic scene. Um, but as, as iconic as Tatooine is, these planets, which we call circumfinery planets because they're orbiting around the orbits of two stars are actually very rare. So only about two dozen of them have been discovered thus far. And so I spent the next two years working on ways by which you know we can conf we can actually prove that this planet is real, and this was um, the majority of the work that I was showcasing at ISAF, where I met Sean. And the primary goal of this work was, you know, like we have a we have a really interesting, a really rare planet here, but how can we prove that it's not some other interference source that's messing up with our data? So you know, um, the star's atmosphere perhaps could be like not homogeneous, and that causes the star to look like it's moving towards us when in fact it is not. Um, so I developed a lot of statistical and computational methods to look for um, things like those. And ultimately, we were able to prove that this planet was not one of those detections. So it's actually a real, it's a real planet and the signals, all of that stuff looks really, really amazing. Last year, my research, I focused more on the AI side. And this is one area where, you know, I had little prior experience. So um, this process of discovering this planet, uh, writing the code to, you know, like identify this planet, as well as, you know, trying to, trying to confirm this planet to prove that it's real was actually very cumbersome and tedious. And that's why the last year of my research, I wanted to see if, you know, like we could try to automate this process a bit by using artificial intelligence. So I worked on developing a neural network um, that for the input, it would take in this raw spectra that I was looking at that has like the spectral lines shifting back and forth if there's a planet and we pass it through the neural network and at the end, the neural network will tell us whether or not there is a planet. So it's basically doing the same thing that I've been doing for the past few years, just much more, uh, much more quickly and much more efficiently. 
So that was one area where I thought, you know, it was very interesting to explore. I didn't really think I was gonna get into scientific research to be very honest. Freshman year, it was just freshman year summer, I had really nothing to do. And one of my friends who was an upperclassman at that time, he suggested, you know, do you wanna, you wanna maybe like try to get, try to do some work over the summer, try to find like a research opportunity. And I ended up, um, that ended up being possibly the best decision I ever made. Um, and, you know, being able to participate in competitions like ISEF and STS has been extremely um, critical because I grew up in, I grew up in the Northeast. I've pretty much been in the Northeastern United States and I've been pretty much stuck in that bubble for the majority of my life. But it wasn't until I went to ISEF for the first time that I met people like Sean that really opened my eyes up to the world. So every year, ISEF is a competition that's traditionally held in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Phoenix, Arizona, or Los Angeles, California. Uh, these past two years, it's um, because of COVID, it's been virtual, but hopefully it goes back to normal soon. Um, and every year, 1,800 high school students from all across the world, from over 76 countries, I believe, they gathered together in the United States and they shared their research. And what's most inspiring, you know, even though that this is a competition is, is not, you know, like being, not like trying to compete with each other, but rather to learn from each other and have fun with each other. And one of the most critical perspectives that I've developed at ISEF is that, you know, like people around the world, most, many of them who are in severely resource limited environments compared to you, are still dreaming big and far. They're still, you know, despite like a lot of conditions that try to prevent them from doing so, are still innovating and spending their free time like going above and beyond what they're asked to do by society, by their friends, by their teachers, by their parents, all because they want to do something to change the world. And that's the mindset of every single person at ISEF. Personally, you know, like Sean has been one of the people that has really inspired me ever since my ISEF journey in that, um, Every year he chooses a problem to solve and he goes all in on trying to solve that problem. And that's a mindset I think, you know, that is, um, I've tried to adopt going into college. This is my first year in college right now, is that I've started to think about, you know, what kinds of problems do I want to solve? In college, high school, those are some of the best times to go all out and solve those problems because you're not worrying about, you're not worrying too much about your finances. You're not worrying too much about, you know, like um, having like, you know, a partner and starting a family and all that. This is the time to go out there, explore. If you really have like a burning desire or passion to solve a problem, this is the time to really go out and do it. And, you know, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really even have to be a big problem. It can be a small problem that you're starting to explore at first. And then gradually you start to expand and expand and develop like new insights. And that encourages you to go down different paths. But this process, like as appealing as it may sound, it's not at all fun and games. You know, like in per my personal research, there were lots of setbacks I encountered. Um, biggest one was perhaps, you know, when I first went into this job, I didn't know how to code. I didn't really know any physics. I didn't really know any math either. But the really important thing that really carried me forward was just having this burning passion for anything space or aerospace related and having the desire to go in to solve that problem. Personally, as a person, I'm not very, um, I don't learn very well from lectures or exams. Um, like last week, I bombed, like I literally got like below a 50 on both my math and physics exams. And I believe you know, the best way for me to learn is through project-based learning, through actually doing projects and learning as I go, instead of, you know, like sitting in the lecture hall and taking notes or reading from the text and all that stuff. I think that's pretty boring. But, you know, from working on my research project to uh, the ventilator project and, um, and VTOL uh, with uh, Sudo and Sean, that stuff has really made me, you know, like explore in a lot of different directions that I never would have expected uh, that I would be going down um, before, you know, working on any of these projects. And I think that's definitely the best part about project-based learning is that it has the potential to really expose you to a lot of different fields that you might not have any experience with at first. And, you know, my advice to all of you is that if you have a problem that you would love to solve, great. That's the, that's the hardest part. Um, the hardest part is always coming up with the problem that you want to solve and actually formulating it and finding like an approach to go about solving it. And at that point, you know, it's going to be pretty easy to go in and just give, give it all you got. So I know it's really hard right now because of COVID. It's really hard for us to see each other, but also like for those of you who are interested in doing research, it's really tough to go into labs 
And the really, um, really, like the only research that's been happening over the past year was, um, was remote research. But remote research still has its positives because, you know, like even still, you're gaining exposure to a lot of different fields. You're trying to solve a lot of problems that will have life-changing impact. And I think that's what matters the most. Um, just a time check, Sean, how much time do I have left? Or should we move on to Q&A? You have like, you can go on for like 10 minutes if you want, five, 10 minutes, yeah. Perfect, yeah. So I'll talk a little bit about, you know, what um, myself and several other YSI members have been up to over the past year. So uh, you might have all remember back in March of 2020, uh, North America basically, North American society basically just entirely shut down because of the impact from coronavirus. And that time, you know, I thought I was like, when I found out the news that my school was closing, I thought we were gonna be in for like an extended spring break. So I was pretty happy, like, you know, extra week of spring break, I gotta like chill around and like sleep in, catch up on sleep and all that stuff. But I was like, you know, like the days started to drag on, I realized that one thing that I really wanted to do was to see if I could find a problem to help solve this coronavirus thing. And at that time, one of the things that was coming out of South Korea was that because like, you know, testing was in short supply, wasn't very accurate this time. Um, there was a South Korean paper that was published where, you know, like we could look at lung scans of patients and we could use that to see if there's, um, if there's like signs of coronavirus in that patient. So I was thinking, you know, like I, I got an idea, which was, you know, we could take a, we could take a convolutional neural network. We could train it on the lung scans of patients with and without coronavirus. And maybe we could make like an online tool that allows doctors to um, help test patients much, much more quickly and efficiently compared to the test that they had at that time. So I made like a Discord server. I invited, you know, a bunch of, I invited Sean, a bunch of other people that I knew from ISEV. And that's the best part about ISEV is that you get like a whole network of people who are just as passionate about solving these problems as you are. And you get to like work with them on future projects. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, you know, like I thought we were probably gonna get about 10 people to like just chill and discuss some ideas, but actually ended up being closer to 150. And a lot of that was due to Sean's great work reaching out to his network and inviting a lot of people like Studio in. And instead of, you know, like we discussed a lot of ideas like handheld CT scanners and um, the neur neural network, of course, but ultimately um, Sean was actually who, the person who um, helped lead us a pursue a ventilator project. So we were doing something called the Code Life Ventilator Challenge. That's for Montreal General Hospital. And over a period of two weeks, basically, we were working on this project the entire day. Myself, Sudo, Sean, and roughly 20 people in total from, you know, like mostly from Canada. Um, we were just all working on designing and building this ventilator um, and actually trying to, and doing it all over Zoom. That was the most amazing part in that, you know, None of us were working in person. We were doing all of our meetings over Zoom. When Sudo was building this ventilator, uh, he was actually, you know, like we were all on like a Facebook Messenger call and we were just watching him like assemble everything together. And there were like moments when Sudo was like designing the pump um, that like the pump didn't work at first. So like I, I have like so many funny videos of him like trying to work the pump, like and testing it in like a sink that was full of water to simulate fluid flow. I think, you know, when I met, uh, I met Sudo for the first time on the Discord call, he was calling Thomas, who's um, another one of our, not the Thomas from, our, oh, from YSI, but another Thomas who um, worked with us on the ventilator and now in VTOL. And I remember, you know, I didn't know any of them at that point, but I just hopped on the call because I saw there were people there and they were discussing a valve design. And I don't remember too much from that conversation, but we did talk about, you know, like how can we design the valves of this ventilator in the most optimal way. And one of the ideas that we raised was, you know, we could look at um, some of the valves that are being used on cryogenic rocket engines. They handle, you know, fluid flow at a very high rate. They have to be extremely durable. And those are two things that we look, we want to look for when designing like in low cost ventilators that hospitals can make and deploy in, you know, like very large scale environments. And that was a very inspiring call because I realized, you know, like, I don't know any of these people, but we all came together, we all brought our ideas together and really tried to solve, uh, play a role in solving this problem. And although, you know, we did not, um, we did not win the competition, the, I got, I, I think, I still think this is one of the best experiences I ever had over quarantine, which is that I got to work with such an amazing group of people 
that, you know, like if the pandemic hadn't happened, I wouldn't have, like, I would have no idea who, like, Sudeo is today, for example, like, perhaps, you know, that was, like, one of the blessings that this entire pandemic time has really brought me, and from that point on, you know, like, we're all really passionate about solving problems, and we're, we just really want to, you know, like, take our free time and get out there and go beyond what society, what college, what, you know, our families are asking for, and try to innovate to find solutions to problems in the world that we're facing right now. And that is partly why we're working on Beetle. We started out with the idea that, you know, we want to help remote communities get a medical supply system faster because, you know, now like vaccines are being delivered around. Um, at that time, like, you know, ventilator parts were in short supply. And it was those remote communities that could not get these uh, medical deliveries in a very fast manner. And during a pandemic time, this is this really represents like inequitable healthcare. This is really problematic because, you know, like people living in these areas, a lot of them are actually primarily indigenous populations too. Um, they are going to be like getting infected and, at, and you know, perhaps even dying at much higher rates than those who live in urban, suburban, suburban areas. And that is one thing that we really want to help change. And that's um, why we started looking into drone delivery in the medical delivery space first. So I started working on VSOL. Um, one, of, one of our colleagues from that, Ricky, um, who's also at McGill, um, he reached out to myself and a bunch of other team members back in um, back in last April, actually. So a little less. So we've been um, think talking about VTOL. We've been like thinking about the ideas for over um, almost eleven months now. And you know, we spent the first few months just discussing ideas. Over the summer, we started working on actually flushing out the design. And over the past winter break, we've um, over the past, you know, fall semester, we've gotten a lot of experience into, you know, like, what does the business world actually look like? Because, you know, I myself, I've never started a company before. And this was really great. I did to work with, uh, work with these people and try to understand what really goes on in a com in a new company. And over the um, past several months, we've been working on several prototypes of our drones. One full prototype was actually recently featured on Genial which is a French Canadian TV show, um, science related game show that um, one of our colleagues, Alix actually presented on and it actually just aired a few days ago. So, you know, it's been an incredible journey and it all stems from that one risk I took in freshman year, which was to go out there and work on this research. And from that point on, it's just been one thing, one thing has led to another and it's just been super inspiring working with this, these people. And I honestly could not have asked for a more challenging and enriching experience thank you so much brian you know i've i've been working with you for a year now and and i th i think i know you but every time you talk like this i learn more about you and i gain more respect for you it's um the, the way you navigate your ideas and present them to the world is truly inspiring and it, it gives me energy talking to you and i i thank you so much for your time today um, no. And I'm saying this from the bottom of my heart. I'm really honest. Uh, talking to people like you is what makes, uh, you know, getting up in the morning worth it. And um, you, 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 your talk was so com complete. I, I have a couple of questions for you, but you've answered most of them. But maybe you could go back on some aspects and dig a bit more into them because I know a lot of people here are curious about your work. Um, you, you shared you know, your, your incredible research and all the things you've got involved with and, you know, your passion for space. But intrinsically, what prompted you to get involved in the research and, and in your research and all this hard work at first? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think like the biggest thing that drove me towards research was that I never really had it out. I talked about like how, you know, like from when I was younger, I had like this huge passion for aerospace, basically anything space related. But I never really had any outlets to express that interest. Like I never, you know, growing up throughout like childhood and middle school, I never really had a lot of opportunities to um, try to build something that I could actually really be proud of. And I thought, you know, like research um, was probably one of those places where I can actually, you know, go in there, I could work on some really cool stuff and maybe be able to not only get my skill set, but also like, you know, like say like, wow, th this is something that I actually worked on and it's actually going to provide an impact. And I thought that was, you know, something really, really cool because I'm just like a person, I don't do well in like taking classes and all that stuff. I do well, like when I'm working on a project that I'm really passionate about. And that's something where I thought, you know, like I could possibly learn like a new thing or two. And that's what really got hard to try to do that. 
Absolutely. And, and we see that not in a lot of, you know, entrepreneurial minds and, and, and successful people is that, you know, the, the, con the, the academic context does give you incentives to get work done, but it's not the best incentive to discover yourself. And I think that you've taken the initiative to, to pursue your passions and discover who you are through your personal projects. And this is what this community is for, is to encourage that type of behavior and go find these people and tell them, you know, the, the traditional path is maybe not the path, the, the, the right path. And there are millions of other possibilities and uh, yours is just one of them. And to, to show that, you know, you've done all these things on your own is truly fantastic. Um, and, and, you know, the science fairs do, like, you know, allow this, you know, the, the creation of this, this path and if if you mind me asking you know what are the most memorable moments that you've lived through the science fair um your science fair experience possibly the biggest thing about those they've allowed me to realize is that like you know there's at, at this point there's really no point in like trying to like fiercely compete with each other other people and that's what i felt like some people were there were doing but the most memorable aspect was getting to know as many people as possible you know just walking up to people like hey uh what's up, what's your name, where are you from, what's your project about? And that's how I met Sean and a lot of other people from like the Canada team actually. Um, I think, and Jing, um, I, and Jing was one of those people that I, um, I've talked to a lot. And it's just really, it's, it's really hard to even describe because like you're with like some of the people who just, you're so good at it. Just like going out there, finding a problem to solve and, still like at the same time having lots of fun doing that and you know like a lot ISAF actually gave us a lot of social events like we had like we had like a few parties and all that stuff um to really get to know each other and bonding with people in those types of settings you know like seeing what they are like outside the lab and really getting to like get to know them on a very personal level that's the most beautiful aspect of this whole experience and that's one thing I really, you know, like on a tangent, I really miss from in-person events and really hope that, you know, with the vaccine, we get back to having those types of experiences where people can really get to know each other on a personal level much better. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's what makes it worth it is discovering, you know, people like you and getting to work with people like you in the end. And this, this human contact is, is essential. And thank you so much for coming here today to allow me to talk to you and, and have this, um, this human contact uh, again. And, you know, humans are complicated, you know, machines and um, you find ways to make them your friend and beautiful things happen. But sometimes we, we do let each other down. And um, in the, the global context, we've seen a lot of racial injustice in the past uh, months and, and years. And I know you've been really involved in keeping track with all of that and you've been doing a lot of social work. So if you mind me asking, you know, what's your perception of this and how, how can us as leaders, uh, young leaders, deal with these things in unprecedented times and be able to achieve change? What's most important that is that, you know, we're living through um, one of the most turbulent periods in, you know, like history, right? Oh, history right now. But at the same time, we're all alive and we're living in the middle of this context. And that means, you know, like, um, we're already, you know, like, handling what's possibly, you know, one of the biggest challenges we're ever going to face. And that's already, like, pretty commendable. Uh, for me personally, you know, like um, in the U.S. where the pandemic has, to be very honest, has not been managed very well. And with the entire, you know, like uh, reckoning of racial justice over the past year, uh, what all of that has shown me is that, you know, like there's a lot of things. There's, um, if you're looking for a problem to solve, basically, there's really no shortage of problems, problems to solve out there. Mm -hmm. And personally, from for me, I've been, you know, like more interested in like more, I guess, like STEM aspects of all of this. So pandemic related challenges have been like my primary focus, but that doesn't mean like social justice isn't important as well, um, either. It's very important. And, you know, like being able to advocate for more for a society where, you know, people are not being discriminated just because like, you know, the way they look or like whatever they identify as, it's definitely going to be very, very important. And a lot of you know, people my age have been involved in organizing events, organizing, uh, participating in protests to really help advocate for this kind of change to happen. And it's really inspiring seeing them, you know, dedicate this same amount of energy, if not even more energy, and work into doing the same things that we're doing in like, you know, scientific research to help change the world. Um, definitely, um, personally for me, I can't do everything. 
but I have many friends who, you know, branch out to a lot of these other areas that I just don't have the time to explore. And seeing them, you know, advocate for communities and also like developing uh, solutions to pandemic related challenges really underscores like the impact that youth are going to have in the world of tomorrow. Um, to summarize mm -hmm. all of this, one of the things that I want to draw is actually the last line of Sean's TEDx talk, which he gave recently, which is, which is probably the quote that has resonated with me with the most this year, which is that we're going to be the leaders of tomorrow, but we don't have to wait until tomorrow to lead. And that's possibly the most powerful thing I've ever heard um, for a long time. So for all of you, like, no matter what the challenge is, we're, we're all going to be the leaders of tomorrow, but we absolutely do not have to wait until tomorrow to start making change. Mm -hmm. No, that's a, an, an absolutely a very good point. But, you know, with your experience, how would you say that one would approach these problems in, in environment and, um, you know, social justice and the greater, just the whole scope of, of problems that we're facing as a society today? How would you approach such a problem as a young leader today? How would I approach such a problem? That's a very... I guess that's more of an abstract question. Um, mm -hmm. What's your what's your you know sort of path to a solution that you take when addressing different problems? To be very honest, it's definitely going to be very um, it's definitely going to be very different for a lot of people, and depending on the industry as well. But one of the things I'm trying to look for in the solution so that it can have the most impact is that is this going to be a need or a want? And all of the time, I try to strive for the need. I try to um, make a solution that, you know, for the people who are going to be affected by my solution that, you know, they're going to have to, like, there is no choice but for them to really, like, I guess, adopt the solution because it solves a lot of the problems that previous ways of doing things have, you know, really exposed. And that's, you know, one of the things, uh, that's one of the ways we're trying to approach drone deliveries that uh, traditionally you've had people like, you know, um, go on some poorly managed infrastructure and just like drive for days, maybe even sometimes go on like snowmobiles or uh, stuff just to reach these remote communities. And instead of, you know, like instead of what, if, instead of building expensive infrastructure, what if we could just like fly above everything and accomplish the same task uh, cheaper, uh, more in a more environmentally friendly way by using electric drones and also at a much lower cost, uh, at a much lower, you know, like lead time. So those are some of the things that I try to ask myself, you know, like when I start working on a project is that like, how can I design stuff in a way that really maximize, maximizes the impact that it's going to have on these communities that we're targeting? And I think that's possibly one, one way to approach these community initiatives is that, are you building a need or a want? And pretty much if you're working in like community term stuff, there's like the most important thing is the need. Like you don't want to build something that, you know, like, people are going to want, it's great, but like the most impact that you get is really from making things that people absolutely need. And given the context that Sudo has just described earlier with, you know, like environmental issues, racial justice issues, and pandemic, obviously, the need is definitely going to be out there. It's, um, I don't think it's personally a challenge of finding what this need is, but rather formulating like a very, like a very clear plan of attack to mm -hmm figuring out like what you want to do here. That's mm -hmm. the challenge. It, it, you bring up so many good points and you have a vision that, that that takes into account, you know, all the variables that we might face and that one might might not take take into account. And I think that your approach of, of you know, targeting the, the needs and not the wants is definitely the one to, to take. And, and that is advice that I've tried to apply in my life and that my, my mentor has, um, you know, shared with me. And talking about mentors, who, have, have you had anyone that has guided you? And actually, it's a question that um, Olivia um, sent me to, to ask you. And please, anyone in the audience that's, that's here live, don't hesitate to send a message in the chat like Olivia just did. Um, so she's asking, you know, is there, um, is there a mentor that guided you um, in, this, in this path of yours and in this discovery of your passions? Sure. I guess like one of the biggest people was, you know, my research mentor from, um, from like the University of Florida that I was working with. And he was like, you know, like uh, he also wasn't like the best student in college either, but he, he didn't really have like a support network where he could build like his own projects. Like when he was younger, he had a ton of ideas that he just wanted to build 
But it wasn't until like he entered graduate school that he realized, wow, I can actually take this opportunity to build exactly what I want to build. And he tried to pass the same mindset off to me as that, like, no, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you like what you can do, but it's really up to you to like try to solve this problem. So a lot of like people, you know, like a lot of internships and research opportunities these days are like, you know, um, they're okay, like we're gonna give you a problem to solve, like here's how you should try to do it. And you know, like, and this is what you should expect to get. My mentor was not like that at all. So basically, you know, like he was there to help me like provide connections and context and all that stuff. But he encouraged me to really be, you know, like in charge of my entire project and really be able to take ownership of the things that I was doing and see like, you know, how it works from start to finish instead of just working on some something that, you know, like someone else started and some somebody else would like probably finish. Um, I think he was the one who really showed me like when you're doing a project, you really have to go at it from start to finish to get the most out of it. And that's the same mindset I've tried to apply to, you know, my work at VTOL, my work with like uh, Sean and Sadeo on the ventilator. You absolutely get in, in most projects as much as you put in. And um, that is particularly true in the science fair um, spectrum. Um, there was another question in the chat um, asking, you know, how did you overcome setbacks in your research you know we success is paved with failure as we say so how did you manage to to, to, to go over those and and succeed in the end all i got it's inevitable like when you start facing things like these but my best advice is all i gotta do like i feel like you know um doing research doing projects like these in general it's all about like you have like a network of paths and each decision you make like you branch off from like two separate paths. And like when you hit something like in your, um, when you hit something in like your research that's an obstacle that, you know, like prevents you from moving forward, you, all you gotta do is remember that these paths that you've walked on before, they still do exist. So my best advice is, you know, like backtrack a little bit, look into the context of the whole problem and why aren't things, you know, like going the way like you're expecting them to and try like, you know, try taking another path because um, those are all based on decisions you make, and they're all super, um, how do you put this? It's, they're all just, um, they all just help you like formulate like a new train of thought. And I think that's, you know, the most important thing working in a research and startup environment is being flexible about your environment, about like those around you, because especially um, VTOL, we're a team of six, not everybody has ever has like the same viewpoints. And we've run into a lot of roadblocks. We have to evaluate our approach. We even <laughs> I like pivot our focus a lot. And it's it's sometimes it's very frustrating. It's very challenging. But that's also the beauty of working in something like this is because like even though we're facing so many challenges, like even though like the odds are to, like really against us many times, we're still like persevering through and finding a solution together. And you know like if you ever come across a problem like. You can try like grappling with it yourself to see if you can solve it, but never, never hesitate to reach out to those around you who might also, you know, like know the context of the problem, your mentors and et cetera. Whenever I have like, you know, question on VTOL or my re or research and all that stuff, I just reach out to those around me who might have like a better understanding of the context behind that problem. And then together we work to try to find a path around this roadblock that allows us to continue moving forward. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it's, it's, it's true that you have to, you have to be realistic in your approach to success and um, know that it will be filled with heart hurdles and, and right, right at the start, understand that um, that's part of the process. And if you're not in love with the process, the destination won't be worth it. Um, very good points. Um, let's go maybe on, on a lighter side, you know, um, you've casually given talks at NASA, so you know the type of experience that um, the science fair brings you to do. Um, you know, have there, have there, has there ever been a moment in your life where you, you've just thought, you know, what the heck, what am I, what am I doing here? And, and, you know, wow, like this is where science fairs have brought me. What's the moment where you've had to, you know, take a step back and sit down for a second? I think about that, uh, you know, like all the time basically. Um, for, I want to say, uh, going back to like your point about like NASA, I don't think that was like casual at all. The whole time I was thinking like, 
holy shit, is this really like the NASA headquarters, not just like some random like office building in Washington, DC. And I had to like keep on like pinching myself was, like, why, like how the hell did I even get to this point in the first place? And going back, you know, like still at VTOL in like, you know, like with the ventilator, I still ask myself that question whenever, you know, I can meet with the team, like, which is that if this pandemic like hadn't happened, I would not, we would not be sitting here talking today. Like we would not know like each other existed. And that's, you know, like even in like, you know, such a hard time that the world is facing right now, I'm still like, this is probably the silver lining that, you know, getting the opportunity to meet so many wonderful people. And like all of this ties back to the risk that I made in freshman year, which is like, you know, instead of like sitting my summer doing something else, I want to do research. And that's, you know, like a chain of events just happened, just leading me to one thing after another, meeting like a supportive, such like a supportive group of people from science fairs and, you know, like, um, and professionals even. And that's, you know, like how I ended up at NASA. But most importantly, you know, like with Sino and Sean, the, all of this happened out of like the network of like participating in things like ISEF. And it's just super incredible how, you know, like all of these things had to like all happen together in order to make my life today like the life it is. And I think that's, you know, sometimes you just got to go out there and take the risk because you never know what the future might bring. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like as long as you're out there, as long as you're still like pursuing your dreams and really working hard and at the same time in your life, minimizing the distractions that prevent you from achieving your full potential and achieving your dreams, it's all gonna, you're, you're gonna be, you're gonna be doing great things. And I'm, I'm really sure of that. Absolutely. Um, and, and thinking, you know, about talking about these, these huge institutions, such as NASA and, and, and others that inspire us on a daily basis, wh who are your role models? Who, who pushed you to do these things? Are you self-motivated or do you have people that you look up to and that inspire you to continue? I don't think I ever have like a self-motivation <laughs> to do anything like this. I honestly, <laughs> if you ask me to pick a single role model, that's going to be very, very difficult because, you know, um, it's, there are just so many people who inspire me in lots of lots of different ways. And, you know, like, um, Sean, for example, like how he goes out every year to try to find a problem that he wants to solve and just goes in and solves that. That is incredible. Same for you, Sudo. You know, like um, you talk a lot about your work with the McGill Rocket Team, and I really hope like you can you can like give a talk to YSI in the future about your work with the Rocket Team. Because I just think that is just so so cool, and going relentlessly on your on your you know quest to build a lot of life changing things in aerospace and potentially making Montreal a future aerospace hub where a lot of this innovation is going to happen in the near future. I'm just really admired by like your dedication to all of that. You know, there are people like Elon Musk as well, who he does say like a lot of questionable things on Twitter. He doesn't <laughs> a lot. But one of the things I'm really inspired by is that like he doesn't care about what other people think of him. He has this vision of what he wants the world to look like. And he goes all in on trying to make this happen. Um, he's also very smart about doing that, you know, like very strategic about like where his investments are going in. And, you know, like maybe a decade ago, like SpaceX and Tesla were not common names, but I go out, I go out to, for a walk. Every fourth car is like a Tesla these days. And if Elon sure. Musk like was not innovating in the sense, like we would not be having such things. Like the cost of space travel would not decrease so dramatically over the past five years. Like, um, and like other, you know, for example, other, uh, I guess, um, automakers like a lot of the legacy automakers are being inspired to accelerate development of electric cars just because what they see like Tesla are doing. And he's not afraid to be someone who dreams, like who ferociously dreams about the future and get and really tries to make that happen. And that's something I want to do. You know, I want to dedicate my life to dreaming about the future and building it as I'm dreaming about it. And that is that's one thing I'm really inspired by, you know, like basically anybody who's had to come overcome ab like um, adversarial conditions and still persevere in the face of like, you know, all odds against them. Those are people who inspire me. And there's so many of them that like, I don't even think we can get to all of them in this mm -hmm. call. Definitely. I agree. 
I definitely agree. And and you can go in, in, in different role models and pick the, the certain points that you like. You don't have to, you know, adhere to the whole personality of, of that one person. I've myself got a few role models. Uh, but, you know, people like Elon, um, they, they face difficult moments. You know, I think in 2008, he had to decide if he was going to bankrupt Tesla or SpaceX. And he had to sit, you know, between, like he says, his two children. He, he's worked, you know, at 12 years on these companies, sitting between both and deciding which one is going to go underwater. And he, he couldn't make the choice. And so have there been any moments in your life where you, you've had like similar really hard choices and difficulties that ended up bringing you where you are today? A lot of difficult choices that I really had to make was, you know, like whether I wanted to sacrifice a lot of my time to really like pursuing these endeavors because they really do take a lot of time off for me. Which is that, you know, like a lot of times, like, you know, my friends, they want to hang out, they want to do a lot of stuff together. And I just can't because I'm spending a lot of time really mm -hmm. my energy to pursue this. And that is, you know, like, there have been a lot of like people that I've just stopped talking to because of all of that. And it's really just such a shame because like, you know, we've been like, we've all been pretty close for a long period of time. But ultimately what I remember is that there's still the stream that I want to pursue. There's still the stream that I want to follow that's still guiding me forward. And that's what, you know, like inspires me that like, even though like some people might like think of me in a way that like, you know, oh, this guy like spends a lot of time in, in doing work. Um, but there's really like this stream that I really want to follow. And, you know, like one of the things I learned is that like, you got to really balance like your work and social life well. And that's, I think I'm doing a lot better job of that in college. It's just like high school, you know, like managing time and all that stuff to try to get everything done. That was a, personally, that was a huge challenge for me. And, but, you know, getting, getting through that has really, um, has really shaped like, you know, what I want to do for myself in college. Like how do I want to design my college experience and all that. That is so hard. And that's such a good point. You know, when you when you pursue a dream, you sometimes get that tunnel vision where you want to get it done. And you, you realize on the way that you've had to let some things behind. And um, it's it's a hard path to to, to take. But, the, you know, the result is worth it. And I can absolutely relate with thing. your experience. Um, sorry, that's the hardest thing. Yeah. Why? Oh, absolutely. Um, but, you know, the people that are left are the ones that are worth it and the time, the people that are worth your time as well. So yeah. keep around you the people that will follow you through your difficulties and through um, the, you know, the time management that you'll have to impose on yourself. And good friends, uh, usually uh, you can, you know, not see them for a couple of months. And when you see them again, it feels like uh, it was yesterday. So um, the ones that stay are the ones that are worth it, like I've said. Um, so, you know, looking at your experience, what are things that young people, um, if, if they wanted to solve a problem that is meaningful to them, what are three key things, key learnings um, that you'd want to share with them? Um, three um, main points to not forget, maybe starting with, you know, uh, understanding that you may have less time. So, you know, time management and, and such, what would be your three key attributes that you'd recommend them working on? First thing ties into my answer to the previous question, which is that you got to be, you got to be prepared to take risks and really like let a lot of things behind and not be scared of any of these challenges that you're going to be facing. Um, that's the biggest challenge. Second challenge is never let go of your dream. Like you might have a dream uh, that you have right now. It's probably going to change. You might be interested, start in, interested in other stuff. You might want to pivot. But the most important thing is that you still have a dream and that's something you should never let it go because that's something that's really unique to you, yourself only. And it would be such a waste if you let all that talent go to shame. And three is that you don't need a lot of experience to get started. Like you don't have to be like super smart or anything. You just gotta have this dream. Like I talked about how, you know, like when I got into research, I was probably, you know, like the only person left who didn't know like what everybody was talking about. Like no coding knowledge, no like, <laughs> I can no calculus either at that time. But you know, I still managed to make everything work and make the most out of the experience. And that is, you know, like just a testament to you. like don't be afraid of something just because it looks hard. I know everybody says that, but it really is true. Like as long as you just dive in, you're it like you know, it's it's always gonna work. Think of when you're in a swimming pool, like jumping off the diving board into the water is the hardest part but once you enter the water and you start swimming then it progressively gets easier and easier mm -hmm. 
Wow, um, those are some very good points and, and to, to avoid forgetting um, for all of us and even me on a daily basis, I have to remind myself. Um, as for the future, we've talked about a lot about your past, a lot about you know, your present and your advice. What, what's, what's in the future for you, Brian? What are you looking forward to and what are you working on? Um, what's your future looking like? I think near future probably details is going to take a lot of my time. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I want to dedicate my life to building the infrastructure, um, to not only uh, building things that help humanity in general, I want to build stuff that, you know, can make us an inter interplanetary species. And at the same time, I want to build a lot of the infrastructure that helps people get the stuff like into reality, which is why um, a few, several, about a month ago, I started working at a VC to try to um, invest in startups and learn about, you know, like what is the best way we can support these companies as they grow? And how do we, you know, like, um, how do we really help companies in a way such that, you know, like they're gonna be really able to like accomplish their vision? Mm -hmm. Well, that, 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 it makes sense. And it's gonna be interesting to see you and, and your dreams develop and, 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 and beyond. And I, I hope that I'll be able to follow you in, in the inter, interplanetary uh, mission um, because we share that dream. So I Brian, know. thank you so much um, for taking the time today to, to join us and, and talk to us. And if, uh, my last question, I, I won't bug you more after that if you allow me, um, to share one last thing. If, if there was one thing that people would have to, you know, keep from this conversation and, and this, this fireside chat, what would it be? What I want to echo what Sirio said, we're the leaders of tomorrow, but we don't have to wait until tomorrow to lead. If you have a dream, now is probably the best time to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And even if you're really hesitant to pursue this dream and turn that into reality because of you're afraid of the challenge that, that you might face, um, I want to be here to tell you that none of that worrying is going to be worth it because you can really go from zero to one. That is entirely possible. Don't be intimidated by, you know, like those around you who, you know, like might have more knowledge than you because you can be just like them. If you, you know, like go in there and really follow your dream and never let anything detract you from that vision. That's, you know, when you, that's when you realize you're, you have the capability to make a really positive impact on the world, on society, and people are really going to be looking up to you and respecting you for that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brian. It was great talking to you. Thank you so much for having me here. It's been a pleasure speaking to all of you. Have a great weekend, everybody. You too. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, that was so inspiring. Every time I hear you talk, I, I get goosebumps and, and the stuff you do is incredible. And, and you know, Cyril already mentioned it, but uh, you truly are an inspiration for a lot of young people. And, and I hope that uh, people watching this both live and, and at home um, after during the recording, uh, they, they get the knowledge that, that you, uh, you know, dropped on all of us today. And so that kind of, uh, was a good segment for our workshop, um, which, you know, you mentioned before how, you know, the hardest part is finding a goal. And so that was the, the workshop we did on our previous day, which if you didn't catch that, you can watch, uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, young scientists and innovators. So the recording for that conference is there. Um, but for today's, uh, you know, another thing that Brian touched upon was the network of people, the, the, the people you meet, and that is the most inspiring thing. And, and I think I, I totally echo that. That's the best part that I gained from science fairs was, was gaining a community and, and network of people. And so that's why uh, for today's uh, kind of workshop, uh, we were we're super lucky to have got in uh, Blanka Novak. So she is a Hungarian uh, biochem student. Uh, she attended ISEF. Brian and I both uh, met her there. And so she's been to so many international competitions, USIS, so the European uh, Union uh, Young Science Fair. And she even went to the uh, to Stockholm for the Nobel uh, festivities and met a bunch of Nobel laureates in 2018. And so uh, besides doing incredible science fair research and, and, and research in, in biochemistry uh, at university, she started Drop the STEM podcast, which just has thousands, tens of thousands of, of listeners. And so she actually got a, a bunch of ISEF finalists and, and science fair participants from around the world to share their research. And so I think uh, what she's been able to do is truly inspiring in 
not only in pursuing her research on the side, but uh, creating a community of like-minded individuals and being able to share uh, the information of all these young people. And so uh, we have a recording uh, from her since she's from Hungary. There's a kind of a time difference. So uh, she, she sent us a recording. So we're gonna play that um, you know, now, but uh, without any further ado, Blanca Novak. I'm going to share my screen. Please tell me if you um, hear the audio. Um, so I think my um, audio is shared. Uh, tell me if you can hear. Hello, this. everyone. My name is Blanca Novak. Yeah. First of all, thank you, Sean, for inviting me on the YSI conference. It's such a remarkable initiative, and I'm truly pumped to be here. Now, there's a tiny bit of time difference between the US slash Canada and Hungary, where I am. So I'm recording and sending you this video now, which is now being played at your place. So it's like a virtual inception. But to start off, my passions encapsulate public outreach, foreign languages, and science communication. As the host and founder of the Drop the Stamp podcast, I enjoy taking a few moments of science to inspire change and spread passion for science, while also demystifying the traditional scientist phenomenon. I'm working for scientific organizations in the European startup ecosystem, and I'm also founder of STEM Pool, which was awarded and featured on Hungarian Shark Tank, a professional platform to galvanize relations, and also Synthetics, where we investigate the path towards a prosperous future in the world of new era biotechnology. But to get the full pick into frame, I'm a young scientist in microbiology and phytochemistry, but let me tell you something, I did not warn being one. My aunt actually had been suffering from various lethal infections and I wanted to help her. So during my high school years, I developed a novel solution preparation method that basically acts against multi-drug resistant strains with high efficacy while also promoting microbiome health. With this project, I received first prize at the Hungarian Innovation Youth Talent Contest, fourth prize in microbiology at ITEL ISEF 2019, and also a special donated prize in bioeconomy at the European Contest for Young Scientists, which was a pivotal moment because I could connect with my peers on such a different level who shared the same passion for science, who went through the ups and downs of research and who are just awesome people. And the quote is really true. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. So surround yourself with people who inspire and challenge you because even if you don't have a concrete ambition by now, I bet you'll have in no time. The second milestone was when I got to be the Hungarian delegate at the Stockholm International Youth Science Seminar and the Nobel festivities in 2018, where I had the encounter with Dr. Tashiku Honju, the Nobel Prize laureate in medicine. During our conversation, he shared the influence of leading by example, which has proven to be so vital in the era of networking we're living in, which when you blow the foam off top can imply pretending to be friends with someone while having a secret agenda for that person. So make sure that your behind the scene person matches up with your public one which is truly the essence of authenticity and the key to building long-lasting relationships. And I cannot leave out ISEF, during which I noticed that beyond the incredible scientific experience, something extraordinary takes place. Minds on fire with a similar enthusiasm for science are connected in an amazing way. So a few days after my plane landed back home, which, believe me, took a couple of hours, I knew that the impactful conversations we shared should not go in vain, but be shared with others. So one day, that invisible light bulb turned on above my head, and I knew I need to host a podcast. So 
I sketched down a few names that essentially boil down to Drop the Stem podcast, inspired by the brilliant move of dropping the mic. I knew that the guests would be dropping some truth bombs, and let me tell you, they have not failed me ever since, including Brian Wu, the out-of-this-world cool scientist who is today's speaker as well, and the exceptional Sean Bake too. I started it in May 2019, so the pod will celebrate its second birthday with around 20,000 listens. It's becoming one of the largest youth scientific podcasts. If I date back, the hardest part was the sound check. To eliminate the box of sound of recording during the hot summer, in the middle of our living room, I set up a legit tent that functioned more of a sauna slash detoxification therapy than a studio. Or I also recorded under a thick furry blanket wrapped around myself with the mic and me being underneath it. But we ditched those items quite a long time ago, but I can say that figuring out the nitty-gritty details was one of the hardest. So if you're pouring into a new research, remember that between the idea and the execution part, a long road lies. In the startup world, we have this concept of MVP, which stands for Minimum Viable Product. MVP is not carved into stone, it's more minimal than you would think. The alpha phase is your stepping stone, not your end goal. So avoid the trap of trying to make things look perfect, because perfection, by definition, implies that it's not supposed to change or adapt. When we think back to the 90s movies, you had distinct character types. There was the artsy, the popular, the goth one, but the nerdy was displayed as a bit off on the suburbs. Over the years, due to positive reinforcements, we are changing the narrative because we see that the ones who were considered nerds in the 90s are now successful CEOs, entrepreneurs, and accomplished scientists. But there's still the stigma of being nerdy. Young scientists are not solely represented by booth numbers or abstracts. Therefore, I'm focused on presenting the person on the podcast beyond the project board. Our unique blueprint is way more complicated and complex than some external hashtags you put on someone. In the gang, you see that scientists are talented opera singers aviation enthusiast pilots, sport champs, volunteering future doctors, just to highlight a few. The pod was actually invited to the first alumni conference of USIS in Sofia, Bulgaria, to do interviews with the talented young scientists and also other invitations to national science competitions, which sadly got canceled due to COVID. But interestingly, in Sofia, when it came to choosing the interviewees, 80% of them actually got a prize. So you can imagine that during the ceremony, I went into total soccer mom mode when they were announced. But the podcast guests are from Society for Science in the Public, Regenera and ISAF, SIAS, USIS, RSI, iGEM, and a recent partner is Inspo Science Canada. And I'm so thankful that the message is spreading and the stereotypical borders are disappearing. The mic was not a foreign subject to me since I've been hosting events for a long time. Still, in a more casual setting, one of my subconscious hobbies is talking to and genuinely getting to know strangers. You know, people I sat next to on an airplane or a bus in public transport and getting to know their childhood memories, aspirations, dreams in life and breaking that awkward silence, but I can reassure you not in a stalker way. And interestingly, I would not be able to tell you how those people looked like. Instead, the messages behind those conversations conveyed and the general feeling that filled the atmosphere. That's why I love a podcast. A podcast can present you a person at a specific time in their journey. Just as you are sitting on the bus, talking for a few hours, 
but that limited time frame can actually capture valuable bits of wisdom that stick with you for a long time. My tips on starting, whatever your goal might be, I encourage you to solve problems. Find those voids that have to be filled up your unique niche that hasn't been discovered before. But I don't want to put too much pressure on you because innovation is also putting the already existing puzzle pieces in a new and completely different unique order. In Hungarian folk tales, the protagonist usually leaves the home, takes on a new adventure with unexpected outcomes. He packs his bag, takes a few essential items with him, and ventures out to discover new horizons. But don't be an over-enthusiast Sherpa. A backpack overloaded never gets you to the destination. We sometimes need to offload and clarify our purpose so that we could make it to the top of our ambitions. It's not a top tip, but I actually sneaked into a scientific camp organized away from my home to pursue scientific research at the age of 15. But the concept still applies to our project. So just as a protagonist, I left the comfort zone, which is truly the equivalent of the danger zone, indicated with huge rest signs. You might feel safe and in control, but settling is accepting the mediocre. It is comfortable because it requires very little effort, but yields only barely acceptable results. So I encourage you to don't stay there. My first job was at the age of 17, being a Chinese translator in a factory, which was a bit uncomfortable in the beginning, but grew so much during that time. And pursuing ambitions isn't a nice stroll in the park, but rather an assault on a tall mountain, sometimes hanging by crimped fingers on the cliff face. It's not comfortable, but it's inevitable. And note that Failing in originality is better than succeeding in imitation. If you want to feel motivated and encouraged by the journeys of incredible researchers, go to www.dropthestem.com or visit Drop the Stem podcast on Instagram. And a shameless plug here, soon an unconventional episode is coming on the podcast that will truly fuel your ambitions. Thank you, guys. Have an awesome time at the conference, and don't forget, more intentional, not busier. Awesome. Yeah, no, Blanca is an, an exceptional uh, person, and so uh, she does incredible research, but yeah, definitely check out the Drop the Stem podcast um, for hearing equally incredible people like Brian uh, and like uh, Brendan, who we had on our YSI Live. They've all been guests on it. And so you should definitely check that out. So um, we can stop the recording.